Well, they think, well, I'm with a woman, I'm safe. It's not like it's a rare thing. Welcome to Stand Up Speak Up, a Canadian made podcast highlighting important social issues and giving a voice to remarkable people. It's a common perception that women are not as evil or vicious as men, and that would appear to be backed up by statistics. Men commit far fewer acts of physical violence than women, and that also applies to serial killers. There are far fewer female serial killers than males, but the number is big enough not to be ignored, and it may surprise you. Today, we are looking at female serial killers, specifically here in Canada, how they differ from men, their motivations, and some stories of well-known Canadian killers. Your host, Carla Stevens-Tolstoy, is joined by Lee Miller. Lee is an investigative criminologist, finishing a PhD at Concordia University. He's written a number of books about Canadian serial killers, including Cold North Killers. Some content in this episode may be disturbing. Just to put this into, into some context, the highest rates of violence in the United States, that's uh, black male on black male violence. That's hugely disproportionate. And just male on male violence is itself. That's the most common type of violence. So men are a lot more likely to get into physical fights with, with other men than women. However, that doesn't mean that we don't have violent females. There's, there's plenty of them. Would females more likely do crimes of passion? Are there female serial rapists? Are there female serial killers that don't kill as a revenge or a crime of passion? They just enjoy killing. I mean, is there any... Jeffrey Dahmer's the female version. Female homicidal necrophiles, you I think you've got me on that one, but there's certainly sadistic types. 10% of serial killers are female. So it's not like it's a rare thing. Yes, they are less common than men, but that's still one in every 10, right? But are they the ones like the nurse killer who killed patients? Are they like are they more gentle serial killers? Do they do it by ejection or by poison? I mean, are there women that are serial killers or that are, as you said, violent, like that would stab someone to death or slit their throat or um, open up their insides and spread it around? Hmm. So there's a, yeah, there's a few. Typically that would have like, a sexual motive, believe it or not. And because women tend to experience their sexuality in a different way than men, it's a lot rarer. However, there are some cases, so we can start with those if you want. We can start with the exceptions. So as far as stabbing people, there is a woman in England in March 2013 called Joanna Dennehy. And to my knowledge, she is the only... English female serial killer who took sexual pleasure from stabbing victims. Did she that, stab men or women? Like, was it, was she sexual? Like, was she gender specific or just anything goes? Right. So all the victims were males and most of them kind of in their thirties and forties. So you're wondering how did she do this? Well, it helps when you use your psychopathic charm and manipulation to have a seven foot man helping you move the bodies around. So she had hooked up with this guy called stretch. That was, that was his nickname because he was so tall and he was sort of like a, a known petty criminal in the area. And she kind of strung him along on the idea that, you know, she might be in love with him or might have sex with him or something like that. And she got him to do all of uh, the driving and moving the bodies around, but he would take her to where the male victims were, and then she would get out of the vehicle and just start stabbing them, and seemingly doing it for thrills, but was actually diagnosed with uh, sexual sadism, which is getting sexual pleasure or gratification from watching someone's reaction like watching someone else in pain or humiliation and do you think that would have stemmed from early childhood trauma or could it just be how her brain works the, the joanna dennehy case is really interesting because she was a, essentially a completely normal 
kid raised in a, in a good family, no signs of antisocial behavior up until about the age of 16 when she left home and ran away with this older boyfriend. And then it's like by the time her parents saw her again, she was just a complete psychopath. So it's really hard to know what went on with her. It's a bit of a mystery. She had said that her father sexually abused her, but nobody really seemed to believe that at all. And honestly, this is one of the most psychopathic women that I've ever encountered. So where I would be inclined to believe that as a possible cause, in this case, I think it would probably be more just to hurt dad, right? It's difficult. It's really difficult with her. Uh, it's and, and with any female killer that does it for sexual reasons, especially this um, sexual sadism, uh, they're so rare unless they're going to be totally open and forthcoming about it, we just have to speculate. On the other female serial killer who I know got sexual pleasure, we don't really know because with men you have penetration, so you can have evidence of penetration. But with women, you really have to hear it from their own mouth. So we have this nurse, uh, Jane Topan, who was killing patients in the late 19th century, and uh, she had the nickname Jolly Jane. I think she killed 30 plus people, in, including members of her own family at some point through poisoning. And it wasn't until she explained that she liked to crawl up into bed next to the people that she poisoned and feel their death spasms and would orgasm as their bodies were, were in the convulsions it, it wasn't until she explained that that anyone thought there was a sexual motive to it. Like, why would you? There's so many more common motives. So it, had she not told us, we'd have no idea. So I guess that begs the question, is there more female serial killers that do this sort of thing, that do get a sexual kick out of it and just don't say? She said he decided that the afternoon of Thursday, April 16th, 1992, would be a good time because he believed there would be a lot of young virgins in the streets. Some of the most horrifying crimes in Canadian history were carried out by Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka. Paul Bernardo, eventually known as the Scarborough Rapist, already had a criminal past by the time he became engaged to Carla Homoka in 1990. While living in her family's home in St. Catharines, the pair drugged and raped Homoka's younger sister and cleaned up the crime scene before calling 911. She was pronounced dead at the hospital. The listed cause of death? Choking on vomit after drinking too much. What became known as the schoolgirl murders took place in the early 90s, terrorizing residents of St. Catharines and Burlington, Ontario. Police eventually connected the two murders and, despite their best efforts, found no substantial leads. That same year, Carla Homoka was admitted to hospital after Bernardo beat her with a flashlight. He was charged and released on bail. A month later, his DNA was finally confirmed as the Scarborough Rapist. At that point, police put him under surveillance and eventually found out their dark secrets. Carla Homoka agreed to testify against Paul Bernardo on the condition of a reduced sentence. During four days of interrogation, Homoka blamed Bernardo for her sister's death, described how he used Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French as sex slaves before murdering them, and that Bernardo claimed to have raped at least 30 women. She said that, as a wife, she lived in fear of him and was forced to participate in his crimes. He held knives to my throat. He told me I better watch my back. In 1993, as part of a plea bargain, she was convicted after pleading guilty to two counts of manslaughter and was to serve two 12-year sentences concurrently. Later that year, Bernardo's lawyer discovered videotapes had been missed in the initial police search of the residence. They weren't turned over to police until the following year. In the videos, Carla Homoka was seen as a consenting participant during the torture and rapes of all three women and appeared not frightened at all. Despite this new evidence, the Crown said it was obliged to stand by its original sentence of 12 years. Trial for Paul Bernardo began in 1995 and lasted four months. He was found guilty on all charges, including two counts of murder, kidnapping, forcible confinement and aggravated sexual assault. He was sentenced to life in prison and declared a dangerous offender. In the years since then, he has confessed to additional sexual assaults and appealed his convictions, but has not been released. 
Carla Hamoka was released in 2005 after serving her full 12-year sentence and gave birth to a son two years later. She eventually married and had more children. I think Carla was what you would call a hebristophile. And that is somebody who's turned on by having a violent partner. Now, a very important quality of this is it's not when the violence is being done to them. So when Paul beat Carla really badly, she left him. But when Paul was doing it to Leslie Mahaffey or Kristen French or any of the number of girls that he raped in front of her, it's highly possible that Carla would have been turned on by this if she was a hebristophile. So then she also participated in the sexual assault of these girls too. That's something that we shouldn't forget. And uh, the videos, which obviously I, I haven't seen, but I've read uh, descriptions of, she seems to be quite an enthusiastic participant in them. I mean, some say that she was more sadistic yeah. than Paul was and that yeah. she was more of a manipulator and she got less time because she was a manipulator making her look like a victim. Yeah, so th th those are things that we have to separate. So was she more sadistic than Paul? I don't think so because uh, we can see highly sexually sadistic patterns of behavior in Paul when he was alone as the Scarber rapist. Those were really sadistic, humiliating rapes. But it doesn't mean that Carla couldn't have been somewhat sadistic and that the two kind of fed off each other in a folly at uh, situation. As far as Carla being manipulative, being uh, a better charmer than Paul, uh, I'd say that's almost certainly the case. In my personal opinion, they're both psychopaths. Carla is just a more effective one. And I think she played that sort of innocent little abused girl routine and some very eminent psychologists and psychiatrists and cops fell for it. Um, and in retrospect, you can see it. But she pulled the wool over their eyes for sure. But I think a lot of people want to believe that women can't be as sadistic. But in the reality, there's a lot of women that are human traffickers that bring in the girls under a different, you know, under a different type of relationship, become friends with them and then bring them in. I mean, there's so many examples of girls selling drugs to other girls because girls trust, females trust females more often. Yeah, and that plays a role in a lot of female serial killers. What we see a lot is them hugging up with a male partner who's a rapist or, you know, sexually sadistic rapist. What happens is that they kind of bring out the worst in each other. And a lot of times the female will be used to lessen the guard of a potential victim. So in the case of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka, when they abducted Kristen French, it was Carla that lured her over to the, to the car and uh, pulled out the map and was pretending to look for directions. And then Paul sprung out and grabbed her and bundled her into the car. Do you think that Carla could ever be rehabilitated to have her three children and be married to her lawyer's brother, I think? I mean, is yeah. that even possible? Can somebody ever be rehabilitated like that? Well, did she stop being a psychopath? No. But psychopath is not synonymous with serial killer, right? So if we go with this idea that Carla is cruel and mean-spirited and potentially more turned on by watching acts of violence, but not necessarily turned on by them and, and can live a life without that, then we can see how Paul sort of brought out this serial, latent serial killer part of Carla. But without Paul, she's still going to be a, a, a psychopath, but she could be a semi-functional psychopathic mother. But I, I think one interesting way to look at it is you can see her lack of empathy in the very fact that she chose to have children because now those children are going to have to all suffer knowing that their mother is... And if it's genetic, they could carry that gene. Exactly. And wouldn't you think that her, her husband would have to have something dark about him 
to be attracted to someone that's like that. I mean, he can't be a normal guy. Yeah. I think that at some point you just have to, even if you find her intensely sexually attractive, that there is a moral element that just comes in and says, I know what you've done and I condemn you. I don't want to even be around you, let alone be married to you. I would be very interested in knowing what the dynamics of their relationship are. I mean, I've read a few books and I read the book about the journalist that traveled all the way to find her in the Guadalupe and found her and she was living there with her three kids and her husband and she was living a very domestic life. And, you know, she said she saw her and, and watched her raise her kids. And she's very matter of fact, but I feel like, well, her kids were under six at the time, but when they started having their own personality, she may not like the fact she can't control them. I mean, at that age, you can control them. But I just can't imagine her being a very empathetic, sensitive, loving um, mother. I can see her very, being a very practical mother. But then for, him, for her to move to Quebec, and I actually met a few people that said that they think that people shouldn't judge her and she paid for her crimes. And I think, okay, you must be really young to say that, to not know exactly what she did, because she did horrendous things. No disagreement for me. She should be in prison for the rest of her life. There was all these opportunities where she could have prevented things from happening. Instead, she facilitated them. I just cannot get past what she did. And I can't believe that people are okay with her living in their neighborhood. And when I think that she is free, it drives me insane. We live on a, a planet where if you want to really pull back the veneer, it's, it's absolutely brutal. I think people who have sympathy for Carla Homoka, I don't think they've looked behind that curtain. I think they've swallowed some kind of narrative about her involvement with those crimes. I don't think they've actively really looked into it. Coming up, an in-depth look at serial killer statistics for Canada and where we rank compared to the rest of the world. Lee also shares the most tragic serial killer story he's ever heard. That's when we return on Stand Up Speak Up. Hi, it's Carla. You probably best know me as the producer and host of this podcast. But I also have an online fashion store called Stand Up Speak Up Fashion. And it is actually what pays for this podcast. Please visit our store at Stand Up Speak Up Fashion and have a look at our designs. We have super cool designs. We even have one that's very similar to the topic today called The Predator. And it's done by a super talented artist who created a design of what a predator looks like or the essence of a predator. And it's a picture of a guy wearing a suit, holding a bouquet of flowers with a really creepy big joker smile. But when he opens his suit jacket, it's full of souls, all the souls that he has taken over the years as being a predator. Normally, I'm not so comfortable doing these pitches and saying, talking about our sponsor, but I guess if I want to keep going with the podcast, I probably need to talk about how it gets funded and how we are able to keep it going. So if you like what you hear here and you like our podcast, check out the store. Even rating this podcast is a big help for us. Not saying that we do it to get ranked in iTunes, but it sure feels good when you see yourself in the top 50, which usually we are. So thank you. Welcome back to Stand Up, Speak Up. Carl is speaking with Lee Miller, an investigative criminologist and author of a number of books about Canadian killers. Everybody says Canadians were so polite and, and all that stuff. Does that correlate also to our serial killers? How would Canada rank? Well, I think anyone interested in that question should pick up my book, Cold North Killers, Canadian Serial Murder. In that, I look at all of the worst cases of serial murder in Canada and then try to exhaustively explore just how many serial killers do we have. So as far as our most sadistic killers, like torture murderers, I would say the worst were, to my knowledge, Bernardo, but Paul Bernardo and, and Carla Homoka, but also a, a little known guy by the name of David Snow. And he's kind of more like someone we know to be a serial killer, but they never proved it. 
last time I checked, he was in Kingston Penitentiary, although he would have been moved now. And he was in there for the double murder of a couple in Caledon, Ontario. But he went to Vancouver and he was abducting women and holding them prisoner in the forest and raping and torturing them for like six days as they were tied to a tree. So six days straight of being raped and tortured and humiliated and held captive. That's, that's up there with the worst American killers. As far as numbers go, it's really hard to equal the United States and South Africa. They kind of are at the top. But Canada has over a 100 serial killers, if you include the cases that haven't been solved. It's just that I think the police are less ready to admit to it when they, they know it or should know it. And it's more journalists that find the patterns. Because perhaps that goes with something about the image of Canada. It's, it's that we want to maintain this, everything is good here, everything's safe. We're not like those psychos south of the border, right? But in reality, it just means that they're not as open about it. Would that be the same for female killers? Would you say that? It's about the same around the world. It's about 10%. I can think of five female serial killers in Canada. Who would they be? They'd be, would you say the nurse that just, that just killed all those patients? Was that Woodstock, Ontario? Yeah, Woodstock. Right. Her name was Elizabeth Wetlaufer, and she was one of the angels of death uh, killer nurse types. And from what I understand about her, she was just completely disappointed with the way that her own life had turned out and uh, professionally and romantically and just about every way and seemed to want to take control of it somehow by by murdering people in her care. And she actually wrote poetry that actually were confessions that she put under a different name, but people did read them. So it's, it's interesting. She was very confessional in them. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that before. It, it's almost like you have the secret and you want to tell it because it's such a big secret, but you can't tell any, anyone. So you have to do it under a different guise. Uh, so she's the most recent one. If you want to go back in time, and this ties in with a theme of, of female serial killing, it was uh, baby farming. And this goes back to before women had uh, reproductive rights. So where getting pregnant when you were unmarried was highly stigmatized. So, And they found all those bodies, right? The baby bodies that... Yes, the butter born? box babies. Yeah, what was, what was her name again? Okay, so that was Lila Young, and she worked with her husband, William, and they ran the ideal maternity home in uh, East Chester, Nova Scotia. It was in the early part of the 20th century. Now, so we're talking about evil, so, or, you know, who's the worst, that kind of thing, who's the most sadistic? Well, I kind of went straight to torture, but how's this? You're saying that you tell a mother that if she pays you money, that you will find someone to adopt their child or you'll take care of their child. Let's say the child has got some sort of uh, stigma to it that makes it unadoptable. And that was actually a word that I believe that they use, the unadoptable children. So this could be a physical deformity or perhaps um, an undesirable ethnic background at the time or anything considered in quotation marks wrong with this kid to save money lila young and her husband william would put these unadoptable babies on diets of water and molasses so they would just be slowly starving to death little babies and i think there was at least 300 victims that they ended up, you know, these babies, of course, died. And they ended up either buried in little butter boxes out in the field, or some of them were burned in the furnace or, or thrown into the sea. So it, w when we raise this question about, you know, who who is the worst, it's like, well, what criteria are we going by? Because that's not active torture, but that's certainly a torturous way to die. And those are little babies, and there's 300 of them. Right now, 
I should use the word alleged here because she's only been convicted of the one homicide and to my knowledge is is out and living on the east coast um her, her names have been everything from um melissa ann friedrich to millie weeks to melissa ann shepherd but essentially she's what we call a black widow and this is a woman who marries husbands and allegedly poisons them or or kills them in order to collect their insurance and clean out their bank accounts so we know that uh one of her first husbands she drugged him and ran over him twice with a car and was actually able to convince the court that she played this i'm a woman i don't know how to drive card and it was all kind of an accident. And, oh, he was abusing me, too. She threw that one in there. So we've seen that pop up in, in two cases now, right? Except in this case, it seems to have absolutely no basis. And because of this, she um, went to Kingston Penitentiary, served a really short sentence. And I can't remember what it was, but it was definitely, I think, no more than eight years. It could have been six or four. And while she was there, she gets all this funding to set up like a women's helpline. And uh, she's in a documentary for CBC, Why Do Women Kill, where she explains how she was abused and everything. And then the minute she's out of prison, she enters this world that has the internet. And she starts going on these uh, Christian dating sites, looking for rich old men living in Florida. And she finds a few of them. And those rich old men who she either uh, gets married to or tries to get married to, they end up either dying almost immediately after meeting her or coming to the brink of death. And there's drugs that are found in their system, which they were not prescribed. And she suddenly, you know, has shown up and she's killing through care, which is one of the things that, that women do um, as serial killers they don't kill strangers. They kill the people that are close to them or they get close to someone in order to be able to kill them. And they'll often do it in a more nurturing way. And so it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that all of these men either died or got really close to the brink of death and had medications in their system that they weren't prescribed soon after meeting her. Anyways, then she returns to Canada. She's, you know, in her 70s or 80s now. And you think, well, that's got to be it. I mean, she, she got lucky there. She didn't go to jail for, for murdering anyone. I think she just, it was some sort of fraud that she went to jail for in the States. Comes back to Canada. You, you'd think that she'd be done for that reason. No, she's in the news again. I just finished speaking about her in a public library saying, oh, and this one's out, by the way. This one's walking around. And then, like a week later in the news, I hear how she's in prison again under the name Millie Weeks and seems to have attempted to poison another husband, another old man who had no idea who she was. So that, that one's walking around right now. That would be number four. And, and I think if I remember reading about her, it wasn't for a lot of money, right? It wasn't like she was getting like a million dollars or 500,000. Like, I feel like in some cases it wasn't very much. And, it, and it, there's got to be, she's got to enjoy killing too. It just can't be for the money because I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I don't think it was for huge amounts. No, it wasn't for huge amounts. It's for definitely for amounts that you would like to have. Yes. But like not worth killing someone over. I mean, not that I would kill anyone for any amount, but if I'm going to, if that's going to happen, Oh, it'd have to be a lot. Yeah, you'd want to have to only do it the one time, yeah, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Just once. Yes. So possibility of a psychopathic personality here as well. Obviously, she's charming and manipulative and, and a good liar. She has absolutely no remorse or, or empathy for any of the misdeeds she's done in the past. But there's also this thrill-seeking, right, that it's fun to do this. And one of the ways that we know this is that the son of one of the men she was drugging 
he had gone to hospital like within I think a week of of her moving herself into his trailer in Florida. And the son he figured out that she had something to do with it and had them run blood tests and that's where they they found out there was uh, medications in his father's bloodstream that wasn't supposed to be there. The son went back to the trailer to look at it and he found that she had been on a Christian dating website looking for other prey even before this one was dead. So it's like she's already begun begun the hunt before this one's in the ground. That leads us on to the, the fifth Canadian serial killer who is female, and this is probably the least known. In fact, she's associated with uh, two male serial killers that are really unknown. And that's uh, so her name's Stephanie Bird, and she helped Joseph LeBoucan and Michael Briscoe kill two women within a few days of each other in Edmonton, Alberta. And I think this was in the early 2000s. And that case just completely flew under the radar. Nobody picked up on that. But uh, it was a pretty sick case. I, I guess one of the victims, her name was Nina, and they met her at the West Edmonton Mall. And they asked her, do you want to go to a party? And she said, yeah, that she would. Instead, they drove her out uh, to a golf course at night. And uh, they told her, you know, the party's down this way. They they led her down to this golf course and then just started beating on her with some sort of blunt instruments. I can't remember. Um, she was raped by multiple assailants. And this, uh, this woman, Stephanie Bird, took place in that attack. And uh, they, they found her raped, tortured, dead body on the golf course the next day. And I think it was either the day before or the day after um, Stephanie Bird, Joseph LeBoucan, and Michael Briscoe had all had different roles in the murder of a prostitute as well. And they had cut off her finger or toe, one of her digits. And they were kind of parading it around saying like, look, I'm a killer. Look what we've did. So they're, they're right there. You've got um, five female Canadian serial killers and probably Canada's only heard of Carla Hamoka. While the number of female serial killers is lower compared to men, one thing Lee is about to point out is the difference in how much time women spend in jail for these crimes compared to men. What worries me about when these cases fly under the radar, you know, people go, well, we shouldn't glamorize them or we shouldn't we shouldn't obsess over them or we shouldn't give them any time it's like well yeah okay that's one way of looking at it the other way is if you forget about them if you don't know who stephanie bird is that means that there's a much higher chance that she will get out one day especially as this was something she did when she was about i think she was about 17 so if nobody knows who that person is in 10 years except the victim's families but they have much of a voice but, like, you know, well, we end up with a Carla situation again. Here's an interesting trend. It's that the majority of female Canadian serial killers have seemingly got out of prison even after being caught for being a part of multiple murders. Is it because people just don't believe that women can be, as you said, violent and sadistic? They just don't. They just don't believe it. They think that like a man put a woman up to it every time or she's a victim of some man. Is it always tied back to the male? Yeah, I think in the case of uh, in the case of Carla, it was definitely that. But and you could say all of them, even the nurse. She talks about how she couldn't find a relationship. You know, guys didn't like her. I mean, it's. And because she did it gently, it's not like she's out stabbing someone. She's doing it through medication. I, I, I'm not saying she's going to get out, but they'll probably be quicker to try to rehabilitate her, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. And when we say gently, we're, we're really talking about gore, right? It's not a gory way of killing someone. Yes. Okay, but, you're right. Oh, poisoning someone to death, if, if you were to give me the option of being poisoned to death, depending on the poisons, 
you know, over a period of weeks or even hours versus somebody, uh, I don't know, strangling me or, or stabbing me or shooting me. Um, there could be a case made that the gorier ways are less painful, right? Is, is poisoning that painful? Depends on the type of poison that is used. If it, it's something like um, strychnine, for instance, that makes you, all your muscles seize up and you'll start doing your kind of arms and legs go to the sides. You'll start doing something called like jackknifing off the floor where you're almost like spasming, but you can't move your limbs and you get this grotesque grin on your face where your whole face contorts and it's just burning and all your muscles are clenched and it's an agonizing death. And so, yeah, depending on what, what poison it is, it could be, it could be terrible. And if it's happening in a, in a hospital setting or say someone, a woman's poisoning her husband, sometimes this can take place over, over months, you know, where that person's just vomiting all the time or having all these really severe symptoms. And yeah, of course that's, that's painful. That's, that's terrible. Okay. So what do you think is the saddest story of one of the worst serial killers childhood? So what would just, what's the story that you went, wow, no wonder why they ended up like that. Okay. Well, I'm going to go with uh, Henry Lucas. So Henry Lee Lucas was raised in a cabin without uh, floorboards or electricity. I think it might not have had running water either in the mountains outside of Blacksburg, Virginia. And his, the guy who claimed to be his father, but wasn't actually, Anderson Lucas, he made moonshine and sold it. And he had Henry Lee Lucas drinking moonshine from the time he was a kid. Now you can imagine what that does to even someone like a grown adult. Moonshine is notorious for messing you up. Imagine what that does to someone who's, you know, nine years old, right? And then there's Henry Lee Lucas's mother, Viola Lucas, who is a really dominant, abusive woman. And she is prostituting herself and totally dominating her husband too, to the point where she's bringing men home to this little cabin and she's having sex with them in front of her, not only her husband, but she's forcing Henry Lee Lucas as a little boy to stand there and watch her have sex with all these different men. Beyond that, she's hitting him, beating him badly. She dresses him as a girl for about the first five years of his life. And he has to go to school, dressed as a girl. Of course, he gets made fun of. At some point, the teacher cuts his hair and I, I guess does something to intervene. And that only makes Viola Lucas treat him worse. During some kind of fight that he has with his brother, Henry Lee Lucas gets uh, stabbed in the eye. And because of his family background, it's left untreated and it festers. So then his eye falls out and he has to get a glass eye as he's growing up in this environment there is like a local hillbilly around who's teaching him the pleasures of having sex with animals and cutting their throats while you're doing it he's also having sex with his brother and there's you know there's no one intervening in any of this in fact it's being actively encouraged and at some point, Henry Lee Lucas's dad, who's a drunk and works for the railroad, he gets his legs knocked off by a train. So then he's just kind of pulling himself along on stubs, at which point Henry Lee Lucas's mother starts beating his dad in front of Henry Lee Lucas. And one night, he, the father goes out drunk into, into the cold and just dies outside in the snow. And Henry Lee Lucas is really upset because this, this uh, father was the only person that had really been nice to him. And Henry Lee Lucas's mother's response was something like good riddance or it's about time. So I could keep going, but in short, I think that constitutes a pretty awful childhood. Yeah. Like I'm surprised he, he didn't try to kill himself numerous times. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he was very suicidal. Because that is the most depressing life, but that's almost out of a horror movie. It, it would be almost remarkable if he didn't turn out to be a serial killer. 
This has been Stand Up Speak Up with guest Lee Miller. You can find more about Lee's work and his books along with stories from this show at StandUpSpeakUpBlog.com. If you found this episode interesting and you find yourself fascinated by stories about serial killers, did you ever wonder what that says about you? Is it normal to be interested in these things? Carla and Lee discuss this in our bonus content coming up. Fingerprint me, baby. I've been a bad, bad girl. I've been a wild child, don't need a shove. Lock me up in your prison of love. Throw away the key. There's nothing bad as me. I think I'll bring me now. I've been a wild, bad girl I've been a rope, tied, put on the wet Then a put me free before you get upset If you don't set me free I'll be bad as I can I think I'll bring me now You better do something quick song selection today came from Evie Sands. Now, more with Carla and Lee Miller. What does it say about us that we're fascinated about this, or, or the fact that when you're telling stories, I remember reading it about in the news. I mean, what does that say about us? I mean, we're all a little demented and sick. What it- I think if we weren't fascinated by serial killers, there would be something wrong with us. If you think about what serial killers and sex murderers and the like are fundamentally about it's sex and death. And and this goes back, you know, to, to Sigmund Freud saying that we have the Eros and Thanatos drives inside us that literally within our bodies, we have these forces of life, which is reproduction and wanting to sustain life and pass the genes on. At the same time, we have this other drive, which is interested in, and in, death and that needs to destroy and that we utilize both those drives and and that almost in a way you know we have to draw sometimes on the or even evolutionarily we've had to draw on the darker side of ourselves let's say the shadow in order to kill an animal so that we may eat it to sustain sustain life to go on and then use arrows arrows to reproduce right so the if you look at serial killers as as uh, sex and death, those are the fundamental things at the core of every human being. Now, let's place it in this mass media alienated culture that we live in, where everyone feels, I think, to some degree, like they're just a footnote. They're not even a footnote. They didn't even make it onto the page of history that they're just an absolute nobody. And all the time we're being shown, look, here's an exceptional person. Here's another exceptional person, you know, on televisions, billboards. And then you have people that they can't even 
socialize properly and just wandering around feeling completely lost. Well, there's enough of them that they look at a serial killer and, and they see the same thing perhaps in, in that person. And this whole argument ignores the fact that we're all potential victims of serial killers. The bogeyman exists. He's really out there. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that he's out there and that we're all potential victims. We all, I feel like the only way I can get through is thinking it'll never happen to me. <laughs> right. Which I don't, you know, God, that's like one of my biggest fears. I don't want that to happen. Right. <laughs> but you know, the more aware you are, are of it and the more conscious you are of it. I want to be completely ignorant to the entire thing. <laughs> I want to assume that that's like happens to other people. Okay. <laughs> I'll put it this way. And I had a student that I, I was teaching. I taught about two classes on the subject in, in a sociology class. And she came into my office and she was really freaked out. She's like, you know, I can't believe that we're learning about this stuff. Like, I, I never thought I'd ever hear about any of this. She's like, I, I walk to my car at night now and I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. And I said, you mean you weren't looking over your shoulder before? She's like, no, I wasn't. I'm like, good, because now you're safer. I don't even go out to the parking lot at night. Okay, I take it one step further. Like those people are like, oh, I take my dog for a walk at night. I'm like, oh, no, I don't. Why? I'm like, I don't know. There could be killers out there. <laughs> like, it definitely controls me, but I don't like to think about it. Yeah, but you're being smart about it too, right? There's people that they get fearless and they're like, hey, no one scares me. No one can hold me down and control me. And, you know, then they become high risk. Their activities put them at higher risk of being a victim because they want to feel free. And unfortunately, we don't live in a world that necessarily facilitates that for anyone, but particularly not for certain certain groups of people, unfortunately, are, are more naturally at risk. And then when they engage in high-risk behaviors, even, even more so. So if you're thinking about it and you're taking ways to actively... Um, not to lower your risk of being a victim, well... That's good. So the fear is working for you. Thanks again for listening to Stand Up Speak Up. You can find more at standupspeakupblog.com.